Actually, I do have a slide. Uh -huh. um, I do pathology consulting for a pharmaceutical company called Aveo in Cambridge, but uh, it's nothing related to anything I'll be talking about today, and I won't be talking about any uh, investigational or off-use uh, uh, use of drugs. So um, in putting together this presentation, uh, you'll be happy to know I cut out a lot of things that I was thinking about putting in. The title was uh, looking at uh, tumor heterogeneity in melanoma, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, I'll probably focus uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, sort of what the lab does in case um, there are folks out in, in the audience that are interested in working with us with regard to collaborating on mouse models of uh, tumor biology or melanoma in particular. With a little bit of uh, work with the tumor heterogeneity if, for those of you who came for that. And then a wider view of uh, the research interests which we do, which is quite a bit beyond actually just mouse modeling. So why melanoma? One of the most common malignancies uh, in the U.S. with an ever-increasing lifetime risk is one of the highest uh, rates of increase in the malignancy of any malignancy. About 8,000 people will die of melanoma in the U.S. this year. Uh, about 60,000 people will get melanoma as new melanomas this year. Um, uh, and the idea behind studying melanoma in terms of modeling and other uh, areas is that uh, it's a very metastatic tumor. For a relatively small primary tumor size, uh, it tends to metastasize early in its course and is incredibly uh, treatment resistant. Um, and so we're hoping this would apply to other tumor types as well. Uh, I'm a practicing skin pathologist, so this also um, uh, mesh well with my other interests clinically. So without further ado, uh, this mouse is almost this yellow in real life. It's a little, little garish here, but this is a melanocortin-1 receptor uh, homozygote, which is essentially the same gene that uh, uh, blonde and uh, red-haired individuals also have in people. In foxes, yellow labs, it tends to also be present in other systems. We're modeling with this uh, uh, mouse as well, but that's not really what I'm going to talk about today. So most of the models that we've developed um, were based on a mouse that I made um, in Boston a number of years back, uh, which is a Crelox system of uh, genetic recombination in mice. So um, I'll very briefly walk through this. Um, we have a couple of manuscripts that one can chase down uh, on this. I'd like to get through a fair amount of stuff, though. So what this allows for is um, uh, recombination of a gene of interest. You can turn genes on with this system or turn genes off. And uh, it's an inducible Cree system, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But that, uh, in the context of a skin tumor, allows you to paint on a, a chemical, 4-hydroxytamoxifen, which allows you to restrict the area of recombination just in melanocytes, because that's what we're interested in here, and just in the area where you apply this uh, topical chemical. It also allows you to do this any time from during embryogenesis to adulthood. So it really provides an unparalleled level of control for inducing genetic changes in a mouse model. And you know, I think we'd argue that this is probably, if you're looking at cancer biology on a whole, uh, as powerful a system for modeling it in a genetically engineered model as, as you will find. This is the uh, transgene construct. These are transgenic mice that we had made with a melanocyte-specific tyrosinase enhancer promoter. And here's the Cree element, and it's fused to the uh, mutated form of the estrogen receptor, which allows for uh, that inducible recombination. So a very quick schematic for those of you who don't know how this works. Essentially, you have uh, the Cree ER is made constitutively in melanocytes and basically only in melanocytes for the most part. Uh, it's restricted to the cytoplasm by binding to a chaperone heat shock protein 90. And then uh, upon administration of systemic tamoxifen, which gets metabolized to 4-hydroxytamoxifen in the liver, or by topical application of 4-hydroxytamoxifen, that results in this complex being dissociated. Cree-ER goes into the nucleus, and it allows it to see the sites that Cree acts on, which are these LOX P sites. And what it's going to do is essentially take out the DNA that's between those two sites, cutting both strands, re-ligating them, and what you have here is a reporter promoter, it don't, doesn't really matter what it's called, a transcriptional stopper sequence which prevents transcription from occurring unless this is removed, and a bacterial laxy reporter. And when that Cree works, you get rid of this thing here. So any, the, all of the designs for all the alleles we'll talk about are essentially all the same. You're going to remove a segment of double-stranded DNA between two lock sites, and you can do this in a very powerful way with as many as 10 different chromosomes or alleles in the same mouse, and we've done that um, to date. So, and here you get reporter gene expression. So those of you who know about um, 
This is a, a former MD-PhD student uh, of mine from Vermont uh, doing a uh, 4-hydroxytamoxifen application to a newborn mouse. Usually we'll use like a child's paintbrush or something to apply to the back. Um, uh, I used to always joke that this particular person was rather heavy-handed in, in, in his approach, but um, anyway, he, he, um, he, he, uh, he really helped establish the model, and that's David Curley, who's the first author on a paper I'll show in just a minute. This is the reporter mice, and you can see actually here the blue color represents where that Cree was active. This is the bottom of hair follicles in the bulb area. In the mouse tail, it turns out that there actually are junctional melanocytes, just as they are in human skin. Most of the mouse is covered with hair, and most of the melanocytes tend to be down here. But in certain areas, like the tail or ear, there are those junctional melanocytes. And then importantly also, there are these uh, blue cells here in the region of the bulge of the hair follicle, and that's actually where the melanocyte follicular stem cells are. And we know that we're getting recombination in those cells for a variety of functional ways that we've determined since. But that shows you where that blue stain, um, which is uh, X-gal, is a substrate that gets retained there, um, is showing up. So um, again, this is to provide an overview for the general modeling efforts. And then I'll uh, show an application in a little bit. Now, when you're setting up mouse models of melanoma, uh, what we based these models on was making the changes that happen in human melanoma. And a lot is known about the genetics of human melanoma. There are activating uh, mutations in the BRAF, serine, threonine kinase in about half of all melanoma. Uh, about 40% of familial melanoma appears to be due to the CDKN2A gene, which uh, is involved in RB pathway and P53 signaling. P10 is a little less clear in terms of how exuberant the genetics are. About 30% of melanoma seem to lose the protein product, but there's not really a mutational event that happens with that. And about 5% of melanomas have activating mutations in beta-catenin. And actually, David Rim, who I think I saw somewhere here, has also shown that you see nuclear cytoplasmic uh, staining of beta-catenin in a higher fraction of melanomas. It might be as high as 40 to even higher percent that seem to be a reflection of activity of this gene locus. And that's the tip of the iceberg. There's probably another 15 to almost 20 alleles that we're probably looking at uh, for their role in combination with some of these primary hits just to evaluate them and look at their biology. So this is the paper I was talking about with David Curley. Um, it's a uh, two hits, the BRAF mutation, which we um, use the Cree locks to induce, and then two alleles of P10 loss. And what happens in that model is that um, when one applies it to where all the melanocytes in the mouse are undergoing recombination, either systemic application of hydroxytamoxifen, you can see the Kaplan-Meier survival if you just have P10 alone or BRAF alone, it's the same thing actually, versus both of those, uh, they survive about 30 days. Um, and then they'll be covered um, completely. I don't think I have a, an image of that here, sorry. That's a local recombination. So what will happen is they'll turn from brown to black within uh, three weeks with about 40,000 to even 100,000 new spots. This is a close-up view of the inside of the flank. And they'll essentially be covered by uh, an, uh, a large set of confluent growing tumor masses. To show you uh, on a smaller scale, that, that's the systemic administration. Um, this would be day six after application of 4-hydroxytamoxifen. Within four days, that's the level of change that you will see. And each of these spots probably represents a different uh, new neoplasm in these mice. This is the, essentially, if one had a, a, a sport jacket or something and flapped the inside open, that'd be essentially what you'd be looking at in the mouse skin, uh, the inside of the flap looking out towards the hairs. And these are all masses that one sees. And here's an involved lymph node in these mice. Um, that's a pretty exuberant tumorigenic phenotype, but it isn't the best to study in terms of looking at the biology because there's really too much. We needed to do that to compare with the single hits. So P10 alone, BRAF alone, and things that didn't form those tumors because it has to be an even comparison. However, for just looking at BRAF P10 tumors, what we can do actually is apply about a microliter of 4-hydroxytamoxifen in ethanol. And without fail, within six weeks, we get tumor formation at that site. Um, you can do, essentially, this is the localized recombination that I was talking about, ear, uh, tail. These are uh, draining lymph nodes from this tail melanoma. Um, so this allows you to do uh, drug-based testing because in the other model, they were done as neonates. The mice died by 30 days. You can't really do gavages in mice that are or oral administration of agents in mice that are probably less than four to six weeks. So you really want to start it later 
have something you can follow. And since the growth kinetics are very regular in here, the error bars tend to be less. And you don't have examples like you do with xenografts, so human cells in mice, where um, the tumors uh, might not grow even without treatment, which tends to mess up the statistics. So here's an example of a foot pad melanoma in the mice. And you can see here are some very atypical cells. They actually have what in, in dermatopathology we would call pagetoid spread, uh, where the cells actually go the wrong way, if you want to think of it that way, up into the epidermis. And this is a characteristic we frequently see in human melanoma. And I'll show an example of a human melanoma. It's not quite as pigmented as this, but having these cells that are going upwards uh, into the epidermis. And then also we see especially for um, if we add a couple additional hits to that existing model, but even the BRAF-P10 model, after four weeks of the primary tumor induction in that sort of global induction model, we'll have up to a third to half of the lymph node replaced by uh, malignant melanoma uh, that's metastasized there within a few weeks. Uh, addition of another hit will give us uh, on the order of 250 to 300 lung lesions pretty much every time. They tend to stay pretty small, so there's probably something additional that's needed to make them grow into large, large masses. Um, but nonetheless, it's interesting because you can really tease apart the additive effects of different genetic pathways. And what we're finding with this is that it's really hard to predict. You know, you do BRAF with P10, um, but BRAF with CDKN2A or BRAF with beta catenin and P10 the things aren't, they just don't add up in a linear fashion. There are feedback loops that you really can't uh, identify that well without it. And the advantage to this is that it doesn't seem like we're getting a lot of additional hits because of such an exuberant tumorigenic phenotype. So our view is if we can't figure this out, it'll be a lot harder to figure it out from the human side. This would be a guide to go back to human tumors, which tend to be uh, genomically a lot more complex. So a couple other um, teasers. We had. Uh, bought some nice imaging equipment when we uh, came, came from Vermont. And um, by the way, I hadn't seen that story in the paper. Anytime someone says human interest story that you're not aware of, you're always kind of worried. So I better check that out quickly because I, I didn't speak with anyone about it. So, uh, <laughs> um, But anyway, um, this is a bright field image of a mouse. It's essentially an albino mouse covered with tumors. Uh, this is a fluorescent stereo microscope image. And you see both red and green. Uh, this is a multispectral imaging scope that allows you to actually unmix the signal and separate even pretty overlapping floors like red fluorescent protein and green fluorescent protein, which have broad uh, emission spectra, to a green signal and a red signal. Um, both of these, it's really supposed to be a reporter mouse that converts from one to the other when the Cree is active. And it's not working perfectly here, but just to show you sort of an example of the imaging type things that we're interested in doing. And that actually worked a little bit better in a lymph node. So here's a bright field image of a lymph node. Um, I think it's an axillary lymph node. This would be recombined tumor in the lymph node. Uh, it has some red, but it's a bright room, so it's harder to see that. It's a GFP signal, and you can see the red unmixed signal quite a bit better uh, when you get rid of the other component. You're basically subtracting out different set spectral components with this. So with this also, I'll give you one more example of this in lung, where you have bright field raw and then you can see that it's a lot easier to pick out small spots with this. So the real reason for doing this uh, was to be able to identify even individual metastatic cells and micrometastases, um, uh, as well as um, the reporter system can be used to actually isolate cells from lymph node or from uh, blood. And this is, uh, these are flow uh, cytometry experiments looking at forward scatter, which is just a matter, measure of cell size versus fluorescent intensity, and these are low signals uh, for here, but this is about an order of magnitude low. There's more dots here in all three of these three tumorigenic cases and none really here. So the next step will be to do this with a sorting protocol where you actually sort the cells from the circulation and culture them because it'll be pretty easy to do that moving forward. And we know with certain genetic backgrounds that the cells are pretty exuberant about growing. So you can actually study the biology of circulating tumor cells quite, quite nicely using this system. Uh, and here's a quantitation of different genetic backgrounds where we see much more, many more circulating tumor cells in certain uh, genetic backgrounds than either in wild type mice or uh, in other tumor backgrounds that don't tend to have as many metastases. So we've always been probably most interested in studying the biology of metastasis. Um, and uh, the biology is not really well understood despite the fact that disseminated tumor uh, accounts are probably over 90% of cancer deaths. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why is it's really difficult to model this in a dish. You really need to have a vascular system. 
an immune system and other things to really fully understand um, the different steps, which might be viewed as tumor formation, the initial mass, invasion into the underlying tissue, uh, getting into a blood uh, vessel, usually a lymphatic, but it could be a, a, a venous return blood vessel, um, and then extravasation at a distant site, perhaps lung, perhaps somewhere else, and perhaps one of the most limiting steps might be growth at a distant site. And this is particularly relevant in melanoma, where you might have uh, a primary melanoma that, that's excised, uh, let's say at year one, at, at year two, five, or ten, you'll have a recurrence at a distant site and it's genetically related to the original tumor, and the question then remains is why, why wasn't it growing more in, in the meantime, and what's the biology of those latent micrometastases, which I think are what we see. Just an aside, too, I didn't have a good image of it, but we're also doing for the imaging side of this uh, fluorescent equivalents to PET to positron emission tomography, where you actually measure glucose uptake in tumors, and it's very useful for looking at responses to therapies and so forth, and that's working fairly well right now. So it's a fluorescent 2-deoxyglucose homolog that gets taken up, and with the multispectral imaging, you can um, see it through skin fairly easily, and can also see individual tumor cells if you actually open up the mouse. So the topic that I was going to be talking about is related to cancer stem cells, and I'm really going to just do this very quickly uh, with some references to those who um, will be interested in this field, and also there's a, this is mainly the work that I would be showing what was published anyway. This field has really generated a lot of interest, particularly in, in melanoma. And the thought that tissue stem cells have a relationship to cells in a cancer um, was thought to be intriguing. Uh, there were a number of rules that have been continuously evolving that were set out about eight years ago. And uh, I think some of our data really uh, questions whether some of those things were really probably, you know, uh, define it as, as it should, should have been. But the uh, thought in the field was that these were very rare based on purifying human cells or different populations of human cell lines usually, but even primary tumors, and then sticking them back in mice. And usually needed 10,000 or so cells or even more. And what's become very, very clear is that assay conditions are critical for this. You take human cells, you put them back into mice. Uh, there are different mouse backgrounds that are very important uh, for this. And then the use of something called matrigel, which is this uh, extracellular matrix from a mouse sarcoma that works really, really well for making tumors grow, but the physiological relevance is a little harder to determine. That probably results in a 1,000 to 10,000 fold increase in uh, or decrease in the number of cells that you need to um, make a tumor. Now, I mentioned before that it's thought that th I think one of the things that you can look at as the bottom line of this field is it's become pretty clear that tumors are a lot more heterogeneous than we used to think, that there's um, uh, 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 sometimes it's viewed as a hierarchy in the context of chronic myelogenous leukemia where you have differentiated cells that you can tell that makes a lot of sense. But even in cells that are morphologically very similar, they have different cell surface markers that we just can't see. So for those of you who are interested in the work uh, out, of, out of our lab, um, Matt Held was a graduate student in Vermont who actually now is a postdoc in David Stern's lab down here at Yale. Did some really um, great work uh, uh, over the last few years where um, he's been the only person anywhere to actually take different cells from the same tumor and isolate cells that form tumors essentially every time on single cell injections from other cells that don't really form tumors very often at all, practically you know, less than 10% of the time. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this field in other groups as well. None have really done things equivalent to what Matt had. This was a mouse-based system. The others were all human. Uh, and, uh, but this field is a very controversial field with uh, a lot of evolution still happening. We'll leave it at that. The part I'll talk about today about this area is that Matt had basically isolated three different cell populations, which you can see on a fax diagram with CD34 and P75, uh, the two markers that we've chosen to use. Following treatment with paclitaxel, you can see that the different populations respond differently to this agent. And I think this is something that's very, very important when you're thinking about looking at drug responses in vitro to particular agents where you see 40 or 50 percent cell death. What does that really mean? Well, you might just be killing the cells. In this case, these cells never form tumors in our hands. So you basically killed the cells that wouldn't have formed a tumor anyway. So in evaluating preclinical data for potential utility uh, and bringing it forward into the clinic, I think these kind of experiments are fairly relevant. And uh, furthermore, when one actually uses the three separate, that prior example was the parental cell line or cell culture being treated. 
and seeing what came out after treatment. And the next experiment was actually sorting the three so separate populations of single cells into a dish, uh, each with one cell per well, and then seeing how many live with either uh, temozolomide, relatively standard melanoma chemotherapy treatment, or uh, cisplatin, which is also sometimes used. And there is definitely a difference in the ability of these cells to survive. So suggesting that the heterogeneity in the underlying tumor population might account for differences in drug response. So um, what I thought I'd finish with uh, was some of the other things that we do in the lab. So I just had given you essentially an overview of the mouse modeling. We're collaborating with a number of people that I can see out in the audience already. Most of what we've done so far has been basically testing different LOX alleles of genes and seeing if they get melanoma and if they go have different metastatic patterns. And that's been uh, of interest. And we're now trying to figure out the signaling that seems to cause those different things. Um, we also have had a, a longstanding interest in uh, epigenetics in melanoma. And this is in two ways right now, uh, looking at DNA methylation in melanoma, uh, as well as looking at microRNAs in melanoma. So there's mouse alleles where you can essentially knock out DNA methylation of melan uh, uh, in, in, in particular cells, for instance, oops, <laughs> the elbow advance there. Um, and microRNAs also appear to play a role for that, and uh, nothing today but more to follow. Uh, David Stern and I have, get, have a grant looking at combination therapies in melanoma. This is entirely human cells, uh, mainly derived from the Yale spore and skin cancer uh, by Ruth Haliban and Antonella um, in, in her lab. And uh, this essentially is a high throughput screen trying to find combinations of therapies that might actually work in different gen genotypic subsets in melanoma. So a new area certainly for, for me. Uh, coupled to this are trying to figure out uh, how uh, cells and tumors become resistant to different therapeutics. Right now, this is a central area in the field. As many of you might know, there's a new agent called Plexicon 4032, at least the prior name, I guess, of it, which essentially gets responses in the vast majority of melanoma patients that have the BRAF mutation that I was describing earlier. However, the vast majority of those patients also progress within six to nine months. So you get responses, but they're not durable, and that's certainly an area of great interest currently. Uh, we've become much more interested in the broader field of preclinical testing, taking cell line and mouse data and predicting how uh, the outcomes of clinical trials would be of great utility because this process is incredibly inefficient at, at the time. Um, we also um, have become more interested in cancer immunology, a whole new area for me as well. We submitted a, uh, well, we may be putting in a program project grant with a number of people in the immunobiology division essentially using the mouse model I've described, we've back-crossed this to CT7 BLAC6, um, and it appears now that this may be sort of the primary uh, mouse uh, immunology model uh, moving forward, um, as opposed to B16, which has been used extensively for that purpose and probably has about maybe 5,000 citations just for that model in tumor immunology. So uh, we're trying to, and are nearly uh, done making this model available through Jackson Labs which will distribute it. And the last thing I'll just mention um, right now is that uh, there's this effort called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which um, essentially uh, is a large budget uh, um, recovery act, mainly sponsored bill uh, or, or funded um, effort through NCI where they're trying to sequence up to 200 cancers of a variety of types. And melanoma is one of the ones in this particular group uh, around. I'm on the disease working group of about maybe six or seven people that have tried to, um, to basically drafted the, the uh, clinical data forms for this and gave suggestions about uh, how to actually proceed with uh, collecting the cases. And Yale is actually the first site to be uh, legal to submit cases, which were all banked by the skin spore. So this will be 20 whole genomes, which several might be from Yale, uh, tumor whole genome sequences, the entire genome, normal germline DNA from the same patients, and then exome sequencing on the other 180, and then uh, expression profile, which will probably be RNA-seq, methylation uh, genomic uh, efforts, as well as microRNA. And that's what that'll entail, and that'll be probably done within a year, year and a half. And we're always interested in the context of the spore of taking what we're finding uh, and translating it back into the clinic. And for me, that usually involves pathology-based stuff, although we're getting more interested uh, also in, in clinical therapeutics. So. I'd just like to thank the folks that did all the work. I'm not sure if Matt is here today, but Matt uh, uh, did the vast majority of the um, cancer stem cell work. These are the folks that are in the lab uh, now or recently.
and then it was very important that we had certain alleles. This model was um, constructed in collaboration with Martin McMahon at UCSF, who gave us the uh, BRAF uh, allele that David Dancourt had made, and I had some other alleles from Dana-Farber where I had trained. So thank you very much. Thank you.